Greetings, theists and non-theists. I am the Atheist Paladin. Nassim Herring. As of, as of talking about UFOs and the circles they run in, Nassim Herring is a part of the New Age. And, of course, there's a lot of crossover between those two groups. But, uh, man, this guy is something. Because he's trying to justify his view of reality. What I'm going to refute is his idea of the, the Schwartz child of Proton. Uh, he begins his lecture with uh, talking about how he learned dimensions and stuff at school. And pretty much... I've already recognized the bit that he was using, that he was describing how he was imagining the universe, and then how he was imagining very small things. Well, that's a bit in Cosmos. So, he's already losing credibility, because he's talking about, oh, he thought of this himself, as he was considering the things about dimensions and stuff. And he's ripping off Cosmos. Yeah, you're not very credible. And so this guy wants to make a proof that that there is a connection between the infinite and the finite. What he does, and of course it's sacred geometry, how can you talk about New Age without talking about sacred geometry? He talks about this being an infinite space that is bounded. And of course you draw an equilateral triangle And then you polarize it. So, oh look, Star David, see, sacred geometry. Look at that. Well, you could draw a circle around those triangles. Why? Because. Because he wants to iterate the process. And then you can draw circles around that, and so on. According to him, that's some big revelation, that um, somehow that's the connection between the infinite and the finite. If he paid attention and listened about number theory the day before, he would have found between one and the number two that there's an infinite set of numbers actually begin given any number A and any number B there's an infinite set of numbers. We've known this for a very long time and so thinking saying that there's somehow you could fit an infinite amount of information and a finite amount of space it really means nothing. He's, he's trying to use Zeno's paradox, really, in order to try to connect these two ideas. And that's where he's coming from. So when you start dictating physics according to this sort of harebrained idea, and then ignore pretty much all data, experimental data, because according to him, if the physics physicists truly understand what he was saying there, that they would stop building um, super colliders. Because they would, it would fundamentally mean that there is no smallest thing. He talks about, the, you know, the Planck length, right? But he's saying that is the smallest thing in our universe, so that's the bounded point of our universe. But there are things apparently smaller than that. <sighs> Man, that's stupid, it burns. But, um... No. Our physics relies on there being such a thing as Planck length. Otherwise, the equations and the physics doesn't work. But that really doesn't matter to him. So he goes on about how the universe, that the, the finite vacuum, 
should be infinitely dense. He doesn't really give any evidence for this, no. He really just talks about how, how physicists had to go through renormalization about figuring out what is the, the energy density of a vacuum. And of course they get it completely wrong and by several order of magnitudes because if you take amount, the amount of energy that's in the available universe and you crunch that universe, our universe back down to that point then the, the, the calculated energy would be of infant, uh, be several order of magnitude. 39 orders of magnitude. Too few. But this doesn't dissuade Nassim Harim. He just thinks that means you're on the right track somehow. Okay, so you're predicting the vacuum has 10 to the 90 third, and the universe actually has only 10 to the 50th, well, 52nd or something. If the universe doesn't contain the amount of energy that it's not even calculated in the gravity, I mean calculated in, in the vacuum, then you're wrong because it doesn't match reality. That's why they renormalize the key equations, because it doesn't match reality. If, if you cannot predict how reality is in those equations, then the equations are not describing reality. Now, he goes about how the universe is actually in a black hole, or theorized, that it would have the perfect amount of energy to be in a black hole. But we've already established it would have this amount of energy, and it doesn't have an amount of energy calculated to be in a vacuum, at least according to your theory. So yes, yes, at least at the beginning of the universe, the universe was identical to a black hole singularity. That much is true, but is it said of the universe now? No. For one reason, it's expanding, and so when you expand the universe and you have the same amount of matter, the density is less. And we're an hour in, and we're barely getting into the meat of the issue. He, I know, he's, it's an hour and 30 minute video when it takes him that a nearly entire hour to get to the main piece of the paper. Because this guy likes to talk. And that's just a few problems. So, he's saying, okay, the universe would have a certain density, according to him. So... This is mass, and this is radius. That's all on a logarithmic scale, so every tack is another log, another ten orders of magnitude. That's the same hill here. And so he draws his line from the universe all the way up here, and it goes like this to plaque mass and length to the smallest possible thing and he says well I found that they all fall in a line apparently according to him that you get the universe and then you get your super clusters over here and then you get your galaxies and the core to galaxies and then you get your sun dwarf stars pulsars Oh, you're noticing anything? The mass is about the same, but they're starting to come off the line. But we'll forgive that because it says, isn't that perfect? Then it's his little proton, the standard proton, and then the smallest thing, of course. And it says, well, obviously the standard is wrong because I arbitrarily drew this line. 
and it fall everything falls in this line and the Swartz comes close and the standard proton does not so apparently the standard proton is wrong but of course according to him he's calculating everything according to him according to this line is supposed to be the same density as a black hole as a singularity It even says that organic things obey that, too. Either this guy does not understand the fuck he's talking about. He doesn't understand what a singularity is. Or he's lying through his ass and he's doing it very badly. Now... The fact of the matter is, if I was at the, the density of a singularity, I would not be able to be compressed anymore. That's the whole point of a singularity. You're fitting a finite amount of matter, so you get your matter, and the radius, or the volume, V, is zero! So he's completely off on that. So even if according if he does this, okay, so a pulsar, while having the same mass, is relatively within the same size. Really? No. And if I actually think if you actually plotted a black hole, this black hole will be somewhere over here. Smaller and several orders of magnitude dense, because black holes can contain millions upon millions of solar masses. At least a super black hole do. So that's how he tries to justify his Schwarzschild or Schwarzschild proton because he arbitrarily drew some graph and say it should fall on some line. Now I somehow doubt that the that the supposed graph is accurate because it doesn't seem he understands what a singularity is. A sun is not a singularity. Our galaxy is not a singularity. I am not a singularity. Atoms are not a singularity. But hey. But as supposedly, according to him, since the proton is so much more massive, that there isn't really a strong force. That the strong force is completely unnecessary. So what's actually inside of every molecule, it's just protons. So you get your protons in there, and they're so massive, according to him, and they're spinning around each other. So they're spinning around in here. At C, or near C, according to him, are we starting to see the problem here? Well, if it's just protons inside the nucleus, then what happened to the neutrons? So according to him, according to this model, they don't exist! And that also has other effects. What about nuclear technology? Our nuclear technology is based on the fact that there are such things as isotopes and neutrons. It would not work if there weren't such a thing as isotopes and neutrons. Now, the neutron we did prove exists. It was a little bit harder because they don't contain any magnetism, so you can't really use the magnetic force to direct the, char the neutron because it has no charge. But it was proven to exist. Because without neutrons, there is no strong force. Or well, neutrons are part of the strong force, and a part of what we use in nuclear technology. But not only that, he claims that when measuring the mass of the proton, when measuring that mass of that proton, we get it wrong because we try to separate them from the molecule. And in doing that, that makes them appear lighter. Uh, apparently this guy hasn't heard of hydrogen. Because hydrogen 
is just one proton. That's it. One proton. So that's how we measure the mass of protons. Hydrogen. <laughs> and not only that, we have things... Well, I don't have any other colors at the moment, but we also have things as neutrons. And we're able to dem demonstrate that there is such a thing as hydrogen, and there's even heavier hydrogen. And so he can't he can't claim that's because of proton uh, because of other protons because that would just give it more charge. That would make it another element like helium. So yeah, that's in the same herring. I'm trying to use shapes and figures to prove that there's a connection between the infinite and the finite and then tell scientists that they're wrong for renormalizing the equations even though that means the equations were not describing reality then claim something that there's something that the cashmere effect proves that the that his idea that way of nearly infinite energy density what the Casimir effect proves is that because there's only so much distance in here, you can't have bigger waveforms uh, being produced in there. It's because of the quantum uh, field vacu uh, vacuum. In the quantum field vacuum, you have protons and neutrons, and, well, protons, and the antiproton pair coming into existence and they're annihilating each other. But since there are several times smaller than than that, then you can only have the electrons and any electron pairs. But the, the force that they will exert on on those little uh, metal plates would be smaller than the cumulative force on the outside, and so the plates will close. That's why it happens. Not because the the energy density of the universe is infinite. This guy does not understand physics, and somehow getting the best physics paper at a physics conference, I'll have to call bullshit. Either they had to choose something real quick, and they saw all the math in his paper, because all the math that is there is really just there to justify his new way on the equations, basically. And him justifying the infinite density and trying to draw conclusions from that. But really, that's Nassim Harim in a nutshell. It takes him an hour to 30 minutes to get to that hour and some change. And then he goes on his conspiracy nut things about the flower of life and, of course, more um, sacred geometry stuff that really doesn't have a connection to anything. But, yeah, that's it. So, thank you for watching. And, um... Probably going to be reviewing Good Old Friend later on. Not today, though. But later on, I'll probably be getting back to David Wilcock. So, I'll be seeing him again. But yeah, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that me venturing into the New Age and the alien stuff. I mean, people like Modern are doing. I hope, I hope I'm contributing here, too. So, uh, thank you for calling. Or thank you for uh, watching. And remember, path of righteousness is rationality.